This was sent in to the channel by Engine DIY.com, so thank you very much. I'll leave a link to their website in the description. And if you're into this sort of thing, you want to check it out because they have some amazing models. Like I say, steam engines that are just that little bit more above what you get with Mammoth and Walescos, which are aimed at, originally aimed at children. Much, much better quality, all metal construction, bearings, journals, um, yeah, just that really nice finish. And also they have some static petrol engines that you can build, which are demonstration pieces, very much like you would get in college, really. I mean, they're of that quality. So a really interesting website to check out, and that will be in the description. This particular engine, you can buy this in two formats. You can buy it complete, with, on this wooden plinth. The wooden plinth is just a little bit more money extra, but it is quite useful because you can see you can fit the three AA batteries that it needs for the coil ballast pack, and it all fits under there quite neat and tidy. I believe the wooden base is about $15 or £13, so it's not an awful lot of money. And then it comes complete like this, or you can buy it in component form where you get the engine, the fuel tank and the switch and the ballast and you can build your own base. If you intend to run this um, other than just perhaps demonstrating it to people, it's probably an idea to buy it without the base and build something a little bit more substantial because this is quite powerful. It is 6cc and these are solid cast iron flywheels and when this gets running which you'll see it tends to sort of jump about a little bit on this base but as I say as a display piece and really even if you don't run it I mean as an engineering display piece it's wonderful just to uh, just to look at it all working when it comes down to fuel that the engine runs on it does run on petrol leaded or unleaded it does have this rather nice brass little fuel tank here that you could polish up if you wanted that as a display piece now then if you're just going to run this very very occasionally you can just use lighter fuel in the tank it'll be absolutely fine but if you're going to run it a little bit longer i would recommend investing in a bottle of two stroke oil sort of thing you used to do when you had your moped because there is no lubrication in the cylinder itself it has got a piston there with i think it's three piston rings but there's nothing to lubricate them so it does need a little bit of oil in the uh, petrol itself. Now lighter fuel is fine, but I found with my previous model that can be a little bit sooty, a little bit smoky, and you really shouldn't run this indoors anyway, because it is a fully working two-stroke engine. So I found that Coleman's lighter fuel here, I think uses for barbecues and things, it's pretty much smokeless, and really don't get any soot from that at all. So if you intend to run it as, as a display piece, as I say, if you're gonna build this up into a working engine and drive things off it, I recommend Coleman fuel with a little bit of two-stroke oil. Another thing to consider is the oil feed system. It's very nice actually, you've got these three little brass receptacles here that you fill up with oil and they drip feed onto the bearings there, which I think is a really nice touch. Also, all the gear system, Again, you need to oil this uh, every time that you run the engine. Same with the uh, sort of uh, tap it here and the, uh, the valve follower. Now, any engine oil works for that. I, I tend to use this, I've just got this on hand. This is uh, Castrol Magnatec 5W, but you can use 10W oil. Any engine oil, as long as it's clean, will help. But you, you must remember to do that every time you run the engine. When you get your model from the website, you don't get any real instructions to help you start the engine. A bit of a shame really, but all you do get is a pamphlet which lists all of the uh, components of the engine, tells you the weight of the engine, everything like that. There are some pictures when you open this up and there is some advice here reminding you to oil all of the journals before use. And it does um, show you the regulator and also the points, but it doesn't really explain how you adjust the engine. And likewise, it shows you the electrical components. You've got your ballast coil here and your battery pack. And that's, that's important if you're going to set this up on your own base. Now, when it comes to starting the engine, they hand start. They can be a little bit tricky when you first start until you get the hang of it. Looking at this side of the engine with the switch on the far side, they need the engine needs to be turned anti-clockwise 
on this pulley. Now, one criticism of this particular model is that on my other model, you do have a drive pulley on the flywheel here. And they also supply you with a pull cord, that, like, like, a, like a petrol mower, that you can wrap around and pull it. And that does make starting the engine a little bit easier. You can make or buy adapters that fit to an electric drill that go into the flywheel. And you can spin it up on an electric drill. That saves a little bit of uh, hand power. But once you get everything set up, um, I, can't, I do find with these that just by spinning it by hand is enough to get it to fire, but uh, as I say, it's a bit of a kind of a hit and miss, well it's a hit and miss engine, but it's a bit of a hit and miss uh, experiment until you get things uh, going properly. One thing you've got to watch out for is when you first put fuel in the fuel tank, you'll have a massive air bubble in your fuel line there. And you need to pull the fuel pipe off, and drain that out until you've got uh, all of the air bubbles. Otherwise it will, it will actually lock, it will vapour lock into the carburetor and you won't be able to start the engine. So you want to make sure there's no air getting into the carburetor itself. Now when we talk about the carburetor, it's at the front of the, uh, the engine here. What is quite unique with these hit and miss engines is there's no throttle valve, there's no butterfly valve in the Ventura on the carburetor. So that means that if there was no restriction to the RPMs of this engine, once you started it, it would just go faster and faster and faster and suck in more fuel till it destroyed itself. So it has a regulator, which if I, hopefully you can see down there. You've got uh, two brass weights, very nicely made, on this drive pulley here. And they have a spring. And they work by centrifugal force. So what will happen, as the engine increases in its RPM, they will spin out as a governor, as a regulator, and then, that, then that throws this little device in into the mix. That locks there, and then what happens with the exhaust valve here, what it does, it locks the exhaust valve open, which means there's no compression, which means the engine doesn't fire, so you just get free running strokes when it's helped by the mass of these rather large flywheels. Now when the engine is running and we will start, we will go outside and start it in a, in a moment, you'll, you'll notice that it will just freewheel for normally five or six strokes, then it will fire maybe once or twice to get the speed up again. So it'll be kind of like that's quite normal. That's why it's called hit and miss because it's only firing on alternate strokes. When you apply a load by putting a drag on the flywheel, if you was using this when they were obviously designed, you would have a pulley on here, and you connect this to say a generator. When it's under load, the governor doesn't, it doesn't expand so much, and eventually the engine will fire on every stroke, pump, 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 just like a conventional two-stroke engine. But it meant they were quite very, very efficient when they first designed this, uh, this affair. They were very efficient, they were very easy to work on, which is why they were very popular. I mean, these engines came out in about 1890, very, very popular to around about 1920, and then uh, sort of steam engines became cheaper, and steam engines were more efficient, and of course, eventually, Diesel engines running generators for like workshops and farms became the norm and these very quickly died out. But because of the simplicity of these, these engines, and they were very easy to work on, things like farms and homesteads where people generally were quite remote and they had to do their own repairs on site. These engines were used way up until the start of the uh, Second World War, sort of 1939 onwards, because they were just so easy to keep going. So anyway, that's base, the basics of the engine. A very nice uh, piece of care. I think we'll take it outside in the garden now and then I'll see if I can get it started for you. So as I mentioned indoors, every time that you run the engine you just need to check that everything is oiled. You will also need to add a little bit of coolant in this hopper here. Now if you're going to be running this as I say, set up on a uh, display for a long period of time. This is all aluminium or aluminium, this box. So you really want to add a little bit of uh, anti-corrosion inhibitor, something like antifreeze that like you would use for your car, just very weakly. As I'm only going to use this for this demonstration, I'm just using di uh, plain tap water, but it's probably not the ideal. You don't need to fill it all the way because it doesn't run particularly hot, as long as you've got some coolant in there. 
And that's really about it. You're ready for your first run. Now I've also I've had this running before, so I've got my carburetor setting correctly. It is literally one full turn from the full in position. Ignition switch on, very important, and uh, I'll give it a go. There it goes. So it's running very rich now, so I want to turn it in a little bit. So I just want to turn this in until it starts to falter and then back it off just a turn. There. Okay, so just about there. A little bit of tinkering needed. Just, just slightly increase the fuel every time. Make sure that you've not got an air bubble in your fuel line as well. That will uh, cause you a problem. There we go, it's running. Now once you've got it running, it's going to be running quite rich to start. So I'd leave it running for about a minute. And then you want, just want to turn that uh, carburetor screw in slightly. You'll hear it falter, and when it falters you want to quickly back it off because you don't want to stop it at this stage. There, just there. And that's it. So you can hear that missing, then the power strokes, and you can see the little governor there just lifting away. It just allows it to freewheel. Now if I just put a little bit of power on it there, see that it, oh, <laughs> I was going to demonstrate it, it's, um, it's run out of fuel unfortunately. But I was going to say as, as I put pressure on the flyable there it would begin to fire on every stroke. Let me, uh, ref let me refuel it and get it started again. I did refuel it and just as I was doing that we had this massive thunderstorm and downpouring of rain, typical UK weather. So <laughs> I'm not going to restart it because I think it's going to start again. So we'll finish the video here. It's been going on for quite some time. A couple of things you need to be aware of. You'll notice that I was wearing a protective glove when I was running the, the engine. It, it does help you grip the flywheel because it, do, it does take a little while to start the engine. And also because it's got a complete waste oil drip system it does tend to splash oil all over the place so it's probably a good idea to wear a glove and that's another reason other than the fumes that you don't really want to run this indoors don't start it up on uh, your missus kitchen table because she'll, uh, she'll rip your head off um, yeah a few things I could say it's, I would have preferred if it had, had a, a flywheel puller attached to the flywheel or sometimes they have like a little indent that you can then get an electric drill and you can start it on an electric drill. You can make your own adapter, all you need is two prongs, like two bolts um, through the flywheel there. It's probably something if you were going to run this uh, all the time, it does get a bit of a ball ache spinning it over by hand so you probably would make yourself an adapter and a battery powered drill just to make things a little easier but I mean overall 
what a lovely thing to own and if you was like me in your, in your youth you were tinkering around with their engines be it lawnmowers perhaps a moped or with me or like a, a car and you just like you, know, you just like to tinker you just like to adjust it just to sort of get it running that little bit this is certainly going to be for you you're going to absolutely have a whale of a time with one of these engines really nicely made as well so there it is 6cc hit and miss engine from diy.com thank you very much for them guys for sending it in so i could show it to you i'll leave a link to their website in the description you can go away and have a look have a look yourself they do some lovely stuff on there um, you lose yourself on that website but as always i would like to say thank you for sticking with the video thanks for your view time i'm only a small channel so big thumbs up there for me fred in the shed if you get a second before you go just hit me a thumbs up down below i like to see that i know you appreciate the uh, videos but as always I'd like to say please, please, please look after each other, stay safe, and of course I'll catch you on the next video, guys. Cheers.